everyone, and thank you for joining us on this next session, What Investors Look For in Companies and Founders. I am joined by Andrew Ive of Big Idea Ventures, Albrecht Wolfmeyer of ProVeg, and Roger Leonhard of Blue Horizon. Thank you so much for joining us. Roger was a last minute ad, so we're really excited that he's been able to join us on such short notice. I'm gonna give each of these gentlemen a couple minutes to talk about what they do and who they are. Andrew, why don't you start us off? Fantastic. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Noah and Vegpreneur, for inviting us to come along. Uh, I'm always glad to be on the same panel as Roger and Albert, uh, Albrecht. So uh, anyway, sorry, let's get into it. Uh, Big Idea Ventures, uh, we're focused on solving the world's biggest challenges by backing the world's best entrepreneurs. That's sort of our stated sentence. So we've got uh, a program in North America focused on the North America market. We have a program in Singapore focused on Asia. And uh, very shortly uh, next year, we will have a program in Europe. Uh, so you'll see us popping up in Europe uh, a lot more and helping entrepreneurs in that. We have both a fund and an accelerator. And we can probably, uh, if Noah gives us a little time, get into the differences between funds and accelerators and how they complement each other a little later. We've made 25 investments so far. We're focused on plant-based and cell-based meat, seafood, and dairy companies, also ingredients and technology companies that will facilitate either plant-based or cell-based. Awesome. Albra. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm Albrecht Wolfmeyer. I'm running the ProVeg Incubator, which is an initiative by ProVeg International, a leading food awareness organization. So it's a bit, it's a bit some something else. Um, we are an NGO, a charity, but um, a very hands-on and industry-oriented one, um, tackling the the issue of food from different from different angles and um, going over um, taste and justice and health um, and of course animal welfare. Um, the environment, but it's really important to work with uh, the industry for us, with um, with uh, the food industry, with uh, producers, retailers, investors, and so on as well to have an impact on that on that system to not build something new, but to to help building building uh, this uh, thing for the future now. Um, so Provage is a young organization, but going back like a hundred years or so um, with an association for vegetarians in Germany. So something that was like a yeah, very old fashioned, now an international NGO. And we started the incubator two years ago to support startups um, that um, are focusing on, on plant-based and cell-based innovations. So this is like a unique approach from a mission-driven um, NGO that supports um, startups in that field. Um, we had four batches, four cohorts so far. Um, starting the fifth at the end of this month, um, from more than 40 startups from more than 20 countries. So we're based in Berlin, but it's really very, very international. And um, we're collaborating with other places, with other institutions. And so that's how we met, of course, as well. Um, Blue Horizon and Big Idea Ventures and many, many more. Um, and also very unusual for an NGO for the first time now this year, we're going to invest as well. We started giving grants to to startups to the startups we accept, and then the follow up um, the follow up option of um, further investment. So it's really exciting to to look into that at this moment. At this very moment, we're finalizing our our first investments. Great, and uh, we lost Roger for a moment, but I let's maybe go into a question that both of you can answer. Uh, talk a little bit about the differences between a traditional fund versus an accelerator and what maybe some of the advantages are for founders and why one would choose one or the other. You are on mute, Andrew. That's probably the best way of listening to me. Um, Albrecht, you're, you're doing an incubator, we're doing an accelerator. Should we kind of, or is that just too nuanced? What, what do you want to do? Yeah, I remember no. that we talked about this once and you said the American perspective, at least on this, is uh, is quite is quite distinct. I would say we're a bit more flexible on that on that um on that term, but maybe you want to start about what what is what makes your accelerator so that what it is an accelerator. Sure, sure. So so I used to run uh, and I sort of jumped in very early on in, in Foodex. So Foodex was is the world's first and largest food tech accelerator. And I took over that responsibility for that in its first, just after the first year of its formation, uh, and grew that company over the last three or over three or four years. 
Um, so I sort of liked some amazing aspects of that model, uh, and I want and I but I did think there were some ways we could make it a little better. So when I left uh, and started Big Idea Ventures, I I kind of tried to create a hybrid of that. Um, so let me just talk about what we do. Um, it's a five month model. Uh, most accelerators are typically 12 weeks. Uh, I always found 12 weeks to be really a really short period of time to get much done in. Um, so what we do is we find companies that are very young. Uh, we uh, invest in them. We put $200,000 worth of, of money and time into these companies. And then we hold their hands very, very, very closely and work with them full time over a five month period. Uh, we've got about 100 mentors across uh, industry, the food industry. We've got partners like Bueller, Tyson, um, uh, Tomasic and others who also support the companies that we invest in. And we work with those companies full time over the five months to make sure the product's ready, uh, to make sure it's ready for market, uh, make, uh, to help them prepare for uh, Series A investment, so getting them ready for financing. We introduce them to other VCs and so on. So it's a very a kind of end-to-end -end close relationship uh, that we establish after we put in uh, the money that we do. We've also got a fund, um, and that fund, uh, which is you know in the twenty-five to thirty million dollar range, is to put money, uh, more money, into the best companies that we've helped and worked with and that have gone through that acceleration process. Some accelerators just do the acceleration and that's, you know, they don't have the money to follow on. Others do, we we do have that fund component. Um, so yeah, I know that Noah's been involved in our, you know, in our accelerator. He can probably talk about some of the experiences as of being a mentor in, in our accelerator. Um, but the, the whole purpose is to help companies identify the gaps to fill them in and to get them you know very ready for significant funding at let's say series a stage albrecht how does proveg differ well we used to the first first cohort was a bit longer more in the range of what you said about five months but we actually shortened it to the three month um, period which is used to be before COVID-19, an on and off program, intensive weeks in Berlin, and then two weeks off for remote work with less um, less modules, less workshops, and so on. But now we do a 12-week virtual program, which works, which worked out quite well. Well, we all adjust, we are all adjusting to this situation, and um, like this, we can involve more people, like our mentors, all over the world, from the US, from Asia, and so on, more easily, which is good. Um, it's incubation in the way maybe that it's very early stage and that we that we have a curriculum that goes from very basic things from marketing to branding and then to like follows up the product development and uh, entrepreneurship uh, topics and then a very strong focus on funding and on pitching as well which is very similar i think to many programs and to big idea ventures as well we assign mentors like one-to-one uh, -one mentors to to each startup um, who work with them on on uh, throughout the program and maybe longer if um, if needed and if, if everybody agrees on if both uh, sides agree on that and what's also important that the program doesn't end after the three months uh, the support goes on and we 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 are proud of our alumni community so we can help them um, and we help them as best as we can afterwards as well so it's a longer program if you like it's a life it's a lifelong program or as long as they consider themselves startups so they can get back to us and um, and work with us um so actually what we do we say we are a bit of a high a hybrid we do we are an incubator but our program is for acceleration as well we try to identify those problems the gaps and we make we, we consider um what what's the most important and we we set milestones with the startups that we want to achieve throughout the program um, and this is also what is um, guiding us when it comes to investment. So when when we can agree on something that 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 makes sense as a as a milestone as an achievement, and um, that we think they are ready, um, we make the investment. And of course, we also we always introduce um, our startups to to other investors to either do their pre seed round or seed round, or um, in some cases um, later on uh, help them with their Series A. Um, so matchmaking is really, really important for us. The mentor network is for every, I think, every incubator and accelerator um, are crucial. The mentor pool. Um, 
And for ProVeg, as, a, as an international food organization, we can connect many, many people from the food industry, but also from NGOs, from the investment side. Um, that makes it very valuable apart from all the other things that we do. It's the matchmaking that, that really can make a big, big difference for our startups. Thank you for that. Let's pick up on that in a sec. Roger, we're glad to have you back. Can you give us a little background on what you do at Blue Horizon and how you started? Sure, absolutely. So I'm obviously super, super grateful for, for organizations like Andrews and Albrecht's one, because I think they pick up innovation and entrepreneurs at the very, very early stage when they need support, even with doing the business deck right. So so we decide not to do this. So this is the very, very early stage, like the incubation and the acceleration where we as Blue Horizon are not part. Our offering to entrepreneurs starts with seed financing. So when they are ready to take the first 200, 500K in, we do that. Uh, we then have a venture capital fund, a Luxembourg vehicle, uh, up to 200 million euro. We have raised now, so we invest 10 bigger tickets 2 million, 5 million, 10 million uh, to stay the partner within the companies we really like and we started to trust. And uh, the third the third vertical we are now raising as we speak will be a growth capital fund uh, where we do bigger tickets, 30 to 50 million for companies that have 10, 20 million revenue and really want to grow big. Uh, I call them the stubborn entrepreneurs that want to do it on their own because we have a fourth initiative that gets a lot of press at the moment, which is the Live Kindly Collective, where we try to be a, a third home or the third alternative uh, to companies that have decent revenue, a successful business model, a product that people like, uh, but feel like not selling out to Nestle or Unilever and feel like, ah, maybe I don't want to do it all alone. I would like to join a group of entrepreneurs and that's what we are building there. So in a nutshell, we, we try to be an ecosystem from seed to venture to growth to, to to unite companies to a bigger group and really help them so they don't need to run around for money all day long because that's what I did the last 30 years as an entrepreneur myself and you should focus on the business and not fundraise half of your time. Great. So we've seen so much money and it's still not enough but invested in plant-based companies over the past few months um, given that we kind of more or less cover the world um, amongst the three of you, can you talk about trends that you're seeing? Maybe, Andrew, you could start with your, your Singapore program. Sure. Um, so, so many trends. I mean, if you think about it, what we're doing on the plant-based and the cell-based space is is reimagining or reinventing uh, everything that's in the grocery store. And it's not just a grocery store, it's a convenience store, it's you know, pretty much every single channel where food is sold. Um, entrepreneurs and uh, we and big companies are ultimately transforming the entire landscape. We're undoing all of the work that's been done around animal proteins in the last 100 years. And we're reimagining every single product that exists with an animal protein in it uh, from a plant-based or a cell-based perspective. So there's still an incredible amount of, of entrepreneurialism required there's still a lot of revolution required in all of those products we've we've literally just touched the big you know started started the process touched the, touched only a few of the products that will be transformed um, from a an asia perspective what we're seeing is that there's a a, a significant demand amongst consumers in many of the major cities major major countries in asia for plant-based uh, foods um, and the, the important thing to recognize about what we're involved with is this isn't Andrew and Albrecht and Roger and even you, Noah, making this change happen. We're sort of reporting on it as the consumers make the change happen. You know, they're driving what's happening and we, we're just trying to keep up uh, and, and not probably not doing the best job of it because it's just such a transformative movement. Um, we've got consumers in Singapore, in Hong Kong. Um, in you know uh, uh, Shanghai, in Beijing, in in Malaysia, you know Indonesia, etc., all moving more and more quickly towards plant-based meat, dairy, and increasingly seafood. Um, and there's a lot of entrepreneurialism coming up in all of those places. We've invested in companies in Malaysia, in the Philippines, in Singapore. Uh, we've got a few companies in China. The one thing that uh, I would touch on very quickly in terms of trends is 
they're not all or none of them actually in Asia are trying to create burgers. You know, uh, they're not trying to create the next beyond or the next impossible and following the trends of, of what's happening in North America or other places. What they're doing is trying to create culturally relevant foods for their people and their markets. Because if you think about it, the burger isn't the product that gets consumed most uh, in China. It's the, the dumpling. Uh, it's the meat dumpling. So we, you know, we backed a couple of companies that are focused on plant-based uh, uh, meat dumpling equivalents because they're they're the products that are consumed on a day-to-day -day basis in the hundreds of thousands, in the millions. So if you want to have an impact, if you want to get give people what they want, you need to give them culturally relevant foods in in those in those countries, in those markets, because that's where you're going to get the transformation and the impact we're all looking for. Um, I could go on for hours, but uh, there's many better speakers on this panel than me, so I'll let everybody else jump in. Albrecht, can you give us an overview maybe of, of Europe and in Germany maybe specifically in terms of what, what you're seeing, the trends? Yeah, I mean, trends on, 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 on different levels are very interesting at this, at this moment. There is, um, I want to emphasize that, that plant-based is more than a trend now. It's really, a, we say, a transformation, which is really important. Of course, it's still small, so we don't have to get too excited about all the, the increase Increase uh, increasing numbers in sales and, and more companies and more money uh, also going into that, in that into that space at the same time the meat production is also as you know um, still growing so but it is it is significant and as Andrew said consumer consumer behavior is changing which is maybe the most most interesting and important because that's driving the change that that uh, companies have to follow and that's why all the companies are are um, aware of it now and are doing something introducing plant based um, 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 uh, um, product lines and um, even across categories, which is really cool to see in, in retail, in, in Sainsbury's, Tesco specifically in the UK is, um, is going on through a major shift and leading this. Um, since they, you know, with the Derek Sarno, they, they have someone in that field who is a chef, who's also like a, like a an influencer in that field and also an entrepreneur. And you can see that this is really symbolic for the whole, for the whole, um, development. Um, and then um, that they, um, even have set goals for themselves to increase plant-based, uh, sales by, I think 300% by the year 2025. So these things are, are, are amazing. They're symbolic, but they're also significant when it comes to value and when it comes to, to growth. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not a trend anymore. It's, it's mainstream. Um, um, there's also a private label shift you can see with discounters in Germany, for example, that even like the like Lidl and, and Kenny, those are the leading leading discount stores, are introducing their own private label um, 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 product lines now, um, which is amazing, and they're really promoting this heavily. Um, yeah, and there's there's things like like Nigros in the, in Switzerland, then they have their own like. Um, Butcher um, part of the of the of the of the, of the supermarket for plant based uh, plant based products. So these things are are really interesting to see that this is going like into into the mainstream now. Apart from from that not being a trend alone anymore, it's also interesting to see something like um, Roger uh, Rogers. Um, 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 thing i want to say like roger's pro project cliff kindly i mean this is a brand now this is a communication platform it's a it's a it's, it's a global producers and it's a it's a big investment uh, vehicle and all of this in one in one company so it's amazing to see something like this starting or like like being operative now and and, and growing and of course brands like oatly that have now um yeah, they're getting a lot of backlash for that, but the funding with um, from from Blackstone, I think, is also significant because this shows that investors from all sides and all backgrounds are going into that into that space now as well. So it's family offices, it's uh, it's institutional investors that have a very different background. So that's also it's also amazing. Um, and in Germany, if you want to have one example, there's Rügenwalder Mühle, one of the pioneers in that plant-based field, but they're traditional meat producers. So a couple of years back, they started to introduce first like pepperoni like daily products um plant-based products vegetarian or vegan sometimes sometimes still vegetarian because they use uh, they use egg um to mimic the the the, the sausages and so on and they now make more than 50 percent of their revenues with that with those products 
So it, it may be that a traditional meat and sausage producer will become a fully plant-based company in a couple of years' time. So these things are amazing. That's how the transformation can be can be uh, pinned down, actually. Roger, do you want to comment on some of the trends you're seeing and some of the companies that you're looking at? Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, the landscape has totally changed the last five to six years, uh, and and I would say dramatically after Beyond Meat's IPO, because now we have uh, the UBSs and the JP Morgans and the Bank of Americas and the Societe Generales talking about the impact of plant-based food against the animal proteins and, and and about fermentation technologies and the rainforest gets burned down and maybe more plants are healthier. So what, what I started to preach six years ago and I was ready to preach it for 20 years uh, become, becomes very, very fast common sense. And, and I feel myself from preaching to, to rubbing my knees to get into the first investments like Beyond Meat and Impossible, now being confrontated all day long. It's only about innovation execution and bringing the price point down so, so so the industry has shift from will it happen how we how we raise awareness how we make the consumer aware to us needing to deliver the consumer as andrew has has rightly spoken the consumer is, is ready they want to have the products all over the globe we have offices from san francisco la new york in in, in the us we are we are in in zurich switzerland and in amsterdam we, we uh, have now two offices in asia and and it's everywhere the same the U.S. clearly has started the trend. Europe is aggressively catching up, especially retail, as, as Albrecht just has mentioned. The retail in Europe really wants the products, like, like very demanding, more than the U.S. at the moment. And Asia will catch up very fast. We always know it takes a little bit longer there, one, but when, when, when big Asia starts to breathe, then the wind is coming. So, so I, I would say we are in a perfect storm to, to stay with these pictures and we just need to execute and entrepreneurs need to come with innovation. So we need better input materials. We, we need uh, more affordable technology uh, technologies. We have proven, when I say we, the entrepreneurs that are in the market so far, that the products are tasty, that the texture is right. You, 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 you can distribute it. The consumer wants to buy it. Now it's our job to make them even better and most important, more affordable for the mass for the masses out there, especially in Asia. People are very sensitive to price points, so we need to bring the price point down now. And this can be done with innovation. So let's get to the question of the session. What are you looking for when evaluating companies? And what are you looking for in their founders that kind of decides if you if you make that investment or not? Uh, maybe Andrew, you can start. I'm always the one that goes first. Come on now. <laughs> uh, yeah, so so what are we looking for? Uh, we're looking for, oof, that's actually really tough. Uh, I, 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 so we get around 300 or so companies applying every six months. We sort of open our doors every six months. Uh, our door is open right now, actually. We get about 300 companies or entrepreneurs every six months saying, hey, you know, please invest in us. Um, and then we have to filter through all of those 300 companies to pick the 10 or the 12 that we're going to invest in. Um, it's a combination of factors, but um, I often look for an aha moment. So sometimes I'll read through, you know, through what a company has or what they're doing and what they're trying to, to change. Um, and sometimes I'll get this aha moment where I'll realize just how big of an opportunity or how big of a, an idea uh, these the founder and the founding team have. And it kind of gives me goosebumps. I get this kind of hair raising moment on the back of my arm. And it's just like, wow, if these guys can actually do this, if the vision of where they're taking this company can actually happen, this is going to change the world. It's going to be an amazing, uh, you know, uh, a, a change that, that for the positive that we're all going to be a part of. Um, so I'm looking for that, that vision, that big idea. Um, I'm not looking for people to sort of replicate the other ideas out there and do it all over again. You know, we're not just, you know, we're not in this. To, yes, we're in this to 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 kind of make money. But that's kind of pretty, I would say, down down on the list. We're, we're all about big ideas, you know, great company, uh, great ideas, things that are going to change the world, um, a, a company and a founding team that are going to make a significant difference. Ideally, something that's global or has the potential to be global. You know, we're not really very interested in a company that's going to do really well in the northeast of the United States or even just 
the United States. We're looking for products, technologies, teams who have the ability to ultimately change things in Asia, Europe, North America, South America. You know, we want companies that are going to that have the potential to be global platforms, global products. So big is probably an, in a short answer uh, what we're looking for. Hence the, co- the name of the company, Big Ideas. Um, small ideas can uh, do really well in their little little marketplaces. We want to make this world a better place. And the way we do that is by, you know, changing things in a big way. Uh, so we want companies, technologies, teams, products that have the potential to make a big and positive impact in the long run. Let's switch it up. Roger, let's have you go next. What do you look for in companies and, and founders? So I, I have I have the answer that will stick in everybody's brain, and I have the answer that is probably true. So the first answer is we look for the team, we look into the team, and we research the team. It's team, team, team. Uh, if you have the right founders, and if everything is wrong, what they present to you today, they will figure it out down the road. So, so I, I saw many ideas presented the last six years, and some of them were amazing, and the market was there for it, but the team not ready to execute in it, on it. So, so, so I think it, you really want to see that you have authentic, strong, hardworking people that really want to get shit done. So it's all about the founders for me. Uh, obviously, the more intellectual answer would be it's market product team. Uh, first of all, you, you want to see that there's a market for the product. And I'm absolutely uh, uh, just have the same opinion like Andrew. We only look at companies that can sell a product globally in the future. We don't want to ha- have an investment in a company that will only be successful in Portugal or only North America uh, or only Asia. We, we try to invest in companies that have a plan to go global. If they don't, that's OK, but it should have should have the potential so that's the market uh, the product needs to be a product that is scalable and 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 we want to have products that will cater to everybody so one part of our vision is to to reduce the price of food to increase food safety and food security and i want to invest in products that will feed the poorest of the poor in the future so so we look at products that will be able to scale globally, but also scale down their price and input material costs so they will become affordable. So going global and affordability, this is market and product. And then I come back to my first statement, a really good team that does this out of the right reason. We have a lot of people that jump on the bandwagon now that see, oh, plant-based fermentation. When I say fermentation and when I say sell meat, I'm already a $100 million company. We, we we don't want to have the followers. We want to have people that have knowledge that do it out of their heart, that are good entrepreneurs. Of course, they want to do money, uh, but they really love what they do. And when we can feel that, uh, we, we get really excited. Abra? Yeah, there's not too much to add to that because you're really the pins are down on. It's the team, of course, that that's always um, has to be mentioned first. The team and scalability is important there because we don't want to have these more of these niche products. We don't need more vegan products for vegans or for even not even for vegetarians in the old fashioned uh, definition but of course for for the new kind of generation of flexitarians so it has to be it has to be available it has to be affordable at some point at least you have to see that potential that that you can bring the price point down and um, we wouldn't be scared of having something that is first for the german market but then it would be for the uk or for the french market as well and it could be potentially also go it could go to the us or, or somewhere else on this on this globe and it should not be limited to to to, to nations and to continents to the national markets that's that's true um when it comes to the team for us as an as a as a mission driven organization of course the mission is important but i think this doesn't mean it doesn't have to mean that they, uh, they don't know what the sound business model is or that they have to be scalable and that they have to be um, business driven but when they are more mission driven that's even even better we, we think that, that a strong team that has everything that it takes all the skills covered all the positions are filled with the good and 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 um, strong uh, person uh, persons and personalities um, and when they think that they can have an impact which is beyond just an um, just um, a business impact but also on the food system itself then it's even more interesting for us um, and apart from that that's uh, some of the trends that we mentioned at this at this moment we're specifically looking like I think big idea ventures and others as well um, at egg alternatives at um, seafood and fish alternatives um, 
chicken alternatives because um yeah if you think of chicken as like being the the yeah the the animal that is um that is the highest population on this on this on this planet like billions like 50 billion or so getting slaughtered each year so think of the impact but also of course of the of the business potential that you have there um, and also those hundreds of billions of eggs that are produced in in china alone each year so we're looking at this from the impact perspective on from a, from a, you know from our mission which is to reduce animal consumption by 50% by the year 2040. It's all about reduction. But this is also the business case, of course, that makes it so interesting for, for all these investors and banks and, and so on that are coming into the space now. Thank you. What opportunities are you seeing that are going unaddressed in the market? Do we really need another plant-based burger? Do we need another plant-based milk company? Or are there is there a lack of companies in a certain area? Maybe, Roger, you can go first. Yeah, I'm at the moment totally focused on input material and processing technology. So we, we don't need another burger, but and we don't need another sausage if companies want to do that and we become a local hero. That's great. I think it needs them. People want to have lo localized products, uh, but not something we would invest in. We, we really we really look at the next step where we want to help companies like Beyond and Impossible and, and the Live Kind, the Collective and all this. When I look at it from an innovation standpoint, to bring the price point down of the products and also to make them more healthy. This is something very often debated that we can reduce the list of input material needed and again, bring the price point down. So we have a strong focus when we invest now in upstream and input material. So uh, everything started with tempeh and soy. Uh, then the last few years, uh, pea was the big star when it comes to pea, uh, to input inputs and 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 the upstream technology. And and we want to we want to see innovation in fermentation. We want to see innovation when it comes to seaweed and algae proteins. And there's a whole laundry list what what will come around the corner. So so if I would be an entrepreneur and I wouldn't have decided what I want to do, I want to I want to think more about how do I enable companies like uh, meat and and like beyond and like impossible uh, or, or 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 other competitors against the meat how can i enable them to make a healthier product and bring the price point down and, and this this is my main focus at the moment uh, that i tell my team to look at so upstream technology input material uh, let's call it the battery that the tesla car needs to drive not only fast and far but we also need to bring this battery price down and the lower the price gets which i saw it in elon's presentation two weeks ago the lower we can bring the battery price the lower the car will be and it's exactly the same the, the beyond meat burger will half the price when we can help Eaton to, to get his input material from another source or scaled at a lower price point. What about you, Andrew? What, where do you wish founders would focus more? Uh, so, so, we're, so the areas that we're particularly interested in finding new companies is, is around the kind of uh, fermentation stage. Um, we're really interested in microbial fermentation. Obviously, cell-based is, is something we're betting big on, as obviously is plant-based. But microbial fermentation is a really interesting space that we're looking for some you know, great companies around. Uh, we're also uh, pretty interested in the mycoprotein uh, area. So, you know, leveraging fungi and related to do new things. I think there's an incredibly uh, interesting area of exploration for meat-based and plant, uh, you know, meat-based alternative, or sorry, meat alternatives use, using mycoprotein. So those are two areas that we're we're really interested in. Um, beside the kind of average, uh, the normal plant-based, cell-based. Mm -hmm. um, what I don't, I was going to say, I don't know that we necessarily want entrepreneurs who don't know what they're doing or don't have an area to focus on to just sort of jump into mycoprotein or jump into kind of uh, 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 microbial fermentation because that's where we're saying we need things. Uh, we, we want entrepreneurs who can add something extra or add something new based on their either insight into the market or their understanding of the technology or understanding of the, the, the product so that they can bring something new to the table. So I wouldn't necessarily set entrepreneurs off chasing the microbial, the mycoprotein space, just because we're looking for them. Um, one thing we've done recently, and this is sort of 
uh, a bit different is we we were interested in in finding some great companies on the cell base side related to gelatin and collagen, which is a kind of a significant marketplace that is dropping out of animal, uh, you know, animal animal production. Um, we didn't see much happening um, in the cell based side uh, for gelatin and and um, co- collagen. Uh, obviously, gel tor, uh, has has come up, but that's sort of recombinant microbial. Um, so we we couldn't find anything on the cell based side. So we actually went and built the team. You know, we found the entrepreneurs, we found the scientists who who could do this, who had a specific area of expertise, and we built it from scratch. And we saw new way, uh, new crop doing something similar. You know, three four years ago with Good Catch, uh, where they you know partnered with a chef to kind of create something to build into a white space opportunity. So the reality is, if we can't find the entrepreneurs who are building out those white spaces, and there's a significant number of white spaces out there, we'll, you know, we may build the team and and build the product and build the company uh, with entrepreneurs to make that happen. If anyone's interested in where that white space is, GFI has done a lot of analysis around the white space opportunities across plant based, cell based, and and so on. Um, where there's big opportunities and really very few companies doing, you know, tackling those white spaces, I would get that list from GFI and take a look and see if anything speaks to you as an entrepreneur. Albra? Yeah, I think from the technology side, that's that's all really, really the most exciting stuff that um, uh, Roger and, and Andrew mentioned. Um, I've, what I think is is is, is important and, and interesting as well is what um, Roger said about going more to the like being a solutions company or an innovations company that helps other companies like established corporations with their product or with their production and bring down like make the make the make the ingredients list shorter, doing something against this prejudice that that it's all processed and not healthy and not really sustainable in a way. And that's still a big problem. Now we got the good products, the taste is right, the texture is right, and so on. But um, it's not in a way what people think or some consumers would, would consider natural. So if, if founders have to keep that in mind and can do something about that, that's that's really great because that would be the next stage from just going to from mimicking to really making new products or helping the existing mimicking products becoming more more natural. And I think on the basic plant-based side, and a couple of companies that that Andrew and also Blue Horizon have been uh, working with. Um, also quite interesting to have these more simple plant-based products that could be can be really really exciting if you have the right ingredients and the right recipe and you have the right team that can do something something about it so it doesn't have to be necessarily it doesn't have to be precision fermentation or so but um, it can be some of the companies some of the founding teams that have a, have a pioneering idea in that area that is also exciting but yes apart from that I think um, we're we all waiting for that revolution that is about to happen or is about to begin with um, Perfect Day and a couple of other companies now um, bringing milk proteins to the market that can actually create that mozzarella everybody's been waiting for that has the same functionality, the same the same taste, um, the same behavior. Of course, cheese, as we know, is really like still one of the the big, yeah, the big problem, the holy grail of of, of plant based, and this will be a, a whole new, um, a whole new level of of um, of non animal based uh, protein products. Great. So we only have a few minutes left, and I do want to get to some audience questions. Let's do a lightning round. Uh, if you could give one piece of advice to founders, one thing maybe that you're seeing and that they're doing incorrectly, and if you could speak to a large group of founders and wanted to tell them just one thing. Uh, what would that be? Um, Albrecht, why don't you answer this one first? Well, that's a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> one thing is, yeah, and going back to the team, that if you don't have the right people, it's okay to be ambitious and bold and go there and try something with that, but not just for doing it, for, for working with microprotein, but be, be, be aware of the of the gap that you may have and of the still very challenging environment. So it's not just like, no, everything is easy because everybody's so excited about it and everybody's, or let's say there's so much money in the space. 
do your homework and 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 be be modest and humble still and be aware of your of your own and of your team's um, potential gaps. Andrew, yeah, um, make sure don't just chase money. If you're looking for an investor uh, or investors, don't just chase money. Make sure there's a strong chemistry between you and your goals and why you're doing this and the investors that you ultimately uh, partner with. Uh, it is a partner. It's a partnership. It's a long-term partnership. If your goal, for example, is to is mission-driven um, as well as financially driven, but if, if the core reason why you're doing this is the mission, make sure you're not getting investors who are focused on just the money uh, because there'll be a disconnect and uh, that's a recipe for uh, you know, friction and disaster. So know your why and find investors who have the same why as you um, and and be, be really certain that you're partnering with the right investors. Don't just chase the dollars and the, the you know, the euros. Uh, look for the right investors uh, for you uh, who have the same long-term objectives that you do. I know it's very tempting just to kind of try and get as much money as possible. But having the right relationships throughout this this kind of throughout building that company is absolutely critical for success. Roger. Yeah, I would say my my message to to the two already very helpful ones it would be be persistent. Think what you want and get it. If if you if you want to have this employee and want to hire him, be persistent and just get them in. If you want to have a certain investor on your cap table, after you followed Andrew's advice to get the right ones, get them in. If, if one guy is not answering, write to the other one. Write them on LinkedIn. Write them an email. Uh, go to the website. Uh, I got into in, most of the investments I wanted to get in, I got in through persistence, like an advertising or car, car sales guy. The same with, with the people we hire. I don't hire usually the people that want to work for us. Uh, I try to get the ones that don't want what I want. And, and the same goes for investors. I can be very nasty and, and I'm coming back on all channels. And that would my would be my recommendation when it comes to team, when it comes to investors, uh, be persistent and try to get the right ones because it takes you maybe a little bit longer, but you will work with these people for the next few years. And it's very difficult to exchange an investor, almost impossible. And it's also difficult to let people go that you have hired. So, so really try to figure out what is the team you want to do the journey to reach the goal and then get them. Great. So we have a question here. If you only had three questions to ask a startup in order in order to decide on whether to invest or not, what would that be? Maybe one of you can answer that. Just three questions. Who wants to take it? Yeah, I'm happy to start. It, it was my, my three-point plan. I would first say, explain me how you can go global with this. Can it be a global success? Question number two, explain me how you will bring the price point down so it really goes global and caters also to the poor and not only to the rich, crazy vegans from LA. And uh, the question number three would be, convince me that you're the right team to do this. Thank you. Um, maybe somebody else can answer this one. At what stage is it ideal for a startup to look into investment from a fund? I think that's why, Andrew. <laughs> oh, is that me? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's many different funds at di many different stages. So it's never it's never too early to kind of uh, try and find the right investor or the right fund to engage with. Uh, what I would say is try not to raise try try not to raise money uh, when you need it because it's actually quite a long process. Uh, it d typically doesn't happen in weeks. It happens in in months. So. Um, I would start engaging investors and funds as soon as you kind of get going, even if it's just in terms of establishing relationships, starting to communicate, starting to have, you know, a, a line of communication. Um, it's often easier to to kind of raise money uh, or, or start that process of raising money before you need it. So, yeah, start engaging immediately. It's probably the best way of, of, of going. Maybe each of you, just for our last question, can talk about a recent investment you made, a company that you're excited about and you think is, is going to be uh, big in five years and everybody's going to know them. Maybe you want to start, uh, Abra. 
Yeah, you know, we're we're like um, newbies in that field. We've been working with many startups, but now we're starting to invest in them as well. Um, so it's a bit like um, we're looking into the future here. But there's a couple of companies we're talking to and we're looking at and we're working with um, one working on plant-based uh, sugar-free desserts. So that's really something that could also sustainable packaging. So it could take all those those little boxes and could be interesting. Then there's another one that is, does precision fermentation um, for for dairy alternative products in the future. Um, and another one is seafood alternative. So you can have tuna and, um, and salmon on your shelf soon that is plant-based. So these are exciting, exciting cases. Awesome. Uh, Roger, a company that you invested in recently that you're excited about? Yeah, sure. I'm obviously probably one of the people that don't in understand this precision fermentation and microbiome strategies and cultured meat. I have a team that is 10 times better, uh, but but I'm, I'm really proud to be one of the bigger investors into Moza meat. Uh, obviously, Mark Post was, was the guy that did this. Uh, 250,000 or 300,000, whatever figure you heard, first burger financed by Surgeon Brian, which just led their, their Series B round. And I, I, I really slowly but surely understand that this, that this cultured meat part will have a place. And uh, that's why I'm very, very happy to, to be one of the bigger investors there uh, through our Blue Horizon. And I, I believe plant-based has its space, cultured meat has its space, fermentation, fermentation technology will have its space. It's like in energy generation, storage and, and usage, you will have different technologies for different products and target groups. So everybody should do what they are best in. But it's Moza Meat at the moment. I'm a big fan of it. Awesome. Andrew, any particular company you invested in? Uh, so I, we've made 25 investments. All of the companies have met our criteria of being potentially big ideas that will change the world. So if I chose any one company, I'd have 25 other companies beating the crap out of me with their celery sticks. Vegans don't tend to be too aggressive people, so it would just be celery sticks they'd beat me with. A um, couple of couple of ones that just sort of are in big places. Uh, one is a company called Gen Meat, Z-H-E-N Meats, which is a, a plant-based meat company in China uh, tackling the whole pork space in China. Uh, they've been called the impossible of China. So that's a big, big opportunity of changing the world. There's a company called Meli Bio, which is, has got the first world's first kind of uh, uh, beeless honey. And honey is a multi-billion dollar industry across food, life sciences, uh, uh, skincare, and so on. These guys have a microbial fermentation product around honey. Uh, at the cell level, it looks and tastes like honey, but there's no bees involved. So it's actually more sustainable. Um, then there's a company in India called Evo Foods, which is a, a liquid egg product, uh, uh, quite similar to Just, but just a little bit better. So, um, you know, that's a great plant based company in India that's going to make a difference uh, in India, but then over in North America and other places. So um, three just really quick companies, uh, but all of the 25 companies we have in our portfolio are incredible. So please, please don't beat me with celery sticks later if anyone hears this. Thank you, Andrew, Roger, and Albrecht for joining us for this incredible session. This has been really helpful, and uh, I hope to have, welcome you back in the future. Thank you, Noah. Thanks, Noah. Thanks, Thanks Roger. Thank you, everybody. And all the best to the entrepreneurs.